Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of COP. And thank you for the ones that managed to find this place. Uh, for the ones at home, it took us one hour and a half to get here because of the second day of COP. So I'm really glad to start this event. Uh, we will be talking about new frontiers of oil and gas and increased risk of the environment, climate, society and investors. And we decided to do this especially at the beginning of this COP because this COP is going to be extremely important for the subject of fossil fuels phase out and especially for oil and gas phase out. We are in the middle of a nature crisis, we are in the middle of a climate crisis, but even though we are at COP and we are talking about that, governments are still not making pledges for the changes that we need. We are not getting the diminishing emissions that we need, we are not getting no new frontiers, uh, the pledges are not being enough. So it's really important that we talk about this and we wanted to then uh, exemplify this with two projects that we are presenting and talking about the economics of it and what is going to be the negative impacts of those projects, not only on the natural environment, but also how that will uh, exacerbate the climate crisis. So I would like to talk to you about how we are going to do this. We are going to have uh, three presentations. And now I think you can hear me better. I'm gonna, okay. We're gonna, we are gonna have three presentations and we are going to have a dialogue about this. And the, the scope of the, the event is um, on the planet and implications for the climate, nature, people and the economy. And then we are gonna talk about the, with the panelists about the, in, with the experts in the audience about the economics of it. So I would like to present my, my panelists. One has just run away, but he is coming back. Um, I would like to start with Elena Tracy to my left. Elena works with the WWF Global Arctic Program. Uh, she's based in Oslo in Norway. She's the senior advisor on sustainable development. Uh, her work centers around the issues on transforming the Arctic on economy from one being based on resources extraction to the economy that values the environment, human and in genuine and local indigenous knowledge and the ways of that life that enables living in the balance with nature. Then we have Tord. Uh, Tord is an economist and advisor for climate and energy at WWF Norway. His work is primarily on understanding oil and gas markets and the climate risk associated with fossil fuels investments. And I have the pleasure to work in his team. Then we have Alexandre Prado. He's a climate change leader at WWF Brazil. He's a specialist in business administration and finance for protected areas. He has many publications. He and he worked in WWF Brazil since 2019, and he's leading issues related to climate change, especially on topics linked to deforestation, agriculture, and energy. And then to my right, I have Olivier Bois. He is a policy advisor working on energy transitions uh, and scenarios for IISD energy program. His work focuses on policy implications of net zero emissions scenarios and the phase out of oil and gas production in line with the Paris Agreement goals. Before then, uh, Olivier Bois was in the UNEP and he was in, in the Copenhagen Climate Center where he coordinated the production of the UNEP emissions gap report that we are all very familiar with. And I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Elena Spiritus. I'm the global lead of oil and gas transition at WWF. So let's start with our presentations. I would like to start with Elena talking about the missing the targets fossil fuel production trends in the Arctic. Please. What? The other mic. Oh, okay, that's good. Um, good day, everybody. My name is Elena Tracy, and I represent WWF Global Arctic Program. The Arctic region has been frequently in the news in relation to climate change as a ground zero for climate impact. The increase in temperatures that are rising four times higher than the global average, 
rapidly changing Arctic ecosystems, thawing permafrost, retrieving sea ice. The Arctic is also a frontier region for fossil fuel industries. By frontier, I mean the place where, uh, which is remote, difficult in terms of access and environmental conditions, and with abundance of natural resources. These resources are seen to be there to extract in order to take them to overseas markets where they will be turned into commodities. The Arctic remoteness and harsh environmental conditions, however, do not deflect fossil fuel companies in the exuberant optimism that drives them to push further to the environments previously considered as unsuitable to these types of activities. Today, the Arctic region has a significant presence of oil and gas projects that are spread across three countries, Russia, Norway, and Alaska, United States. All these ambitious, ambitious expansion plans in terms of mineral production and exploration. In my presentation, I will talk about fossil fuel production trends in the Arctic up until 2050. My talk is based on a research that I have completed, and it is published by WW. But let's, for the beginning, look uh, at the global One point five Celsius, and so those emission reduction pathways represented on these graphs as black dotted line, uh, lines. There is two of them. One represents the IPCC one point five um, uh, line, uh, no, no um, low demand scenario, and the the second one is uh, IEA one point five scenario. So on the left graph, uh, global emission production projection, um, we see that productions of fossil fuel will go up until 2030, after which it starts declining. The decline in production doesn't appear to be steep enough. So by 2050, which is a target year of net zero emissions, the gap between the projected global production based on business and as usual and where production should be in terms of meeting climate goals is a world apart. So if the global production trends are looking alarming because the peak is too late and the decline is not sharp enough, the Arctic trends are even more alarming. The Arctic fossil fuel production is expected to peak around 2040, which is 10 years after the global production peak. By 2000, right now, the production levels in the Arctic will be four to seven times higher than required for meeting the uh, net zero emission target. I must mention here that these Arctic trends are driven primarily by the production in Russia, which is responsible this year for about 90% of oil and gas production in the Arctic. So now let's look at the um, map of fossil fuel produ uh, producing reserves located above the Arctic Circle. So we see them clustered around three areas, uh, three countries, Russia, Norway, and Alaska, the United States. In Russia, oil and gas reserves are located in Yamal, Yamal Peninsula, in, uh, also in the east of Taimir Peninsula in western Siberia, and in the Timan Pechora Basin in the west. In Norway, it is all offshore fields located on the Norwegian continental shelf, two fields in the Barents Sea and one in the Norwegian Sea. And in Alaska, all production takes place in the coastal area of the north slope adjacent to the Beaufort Sea. Now moving back to uh, the production levels. As I mentioned, Russia is the biggest producer in the Arctic. By 2050, Russia's production in the Arctic can be seven times of what is required to meet the Paris goal. If we look at the emission reduction trajectories, 
at least half of the currently producing fields in Russia should be phased out to retire prematurely and no new fossil fuel fields should be developed from now on. Aside from the impact on climate as a result of this massive overshoots in production, there will be consequences for Russia's coastal marine environments, especially in the area of the Northern Sea Route. So what is Northern Sea Route? So essentially, it's, it's, it is a shipping route. It has a very special role for these fossil fuel expansion plants in Russia. It runs along the Arctic coast of Russia for about 5,500 kilometers, from the Kara Sea in the west to the Bering Strait in the east. Its navigation season runs from mid-summer until the end of November. However, because of climate change and melting sea ice, the navigation season has been getting longer, and now Russian government wants to have the Northern Sea Route to be open all year round for navigation with the help of powerful nuclear icebreakers. The motivation behind this plan is to be able to deliver oil and gas produced in the Arctic to the Asian markets. These plans will have negative impacts on the marine and coastal environments. So on the map, you see the red triangles and squares. They are showing the fossil fuel reserves that we'll be producing in 2030. A significant share of these fossil fuels, around 1 million tons per year, will be taken to overseas markets via the Northern Sea Route. The government intends to invest massive amounts of public and private finance in building coastal infrastructure, which is ports, oil and gas terminals, methanol terminals, and also investing in shipping capacity, building tankers and icebreakers. So the red color in the map shows the areas that we call the areas of significant conservation concerns, uh, where the shipping traffic will overlap with the habitats of priority species and with sensitive marine ecosystems. And you can see there is a lot of red areas on the map. Pretty much it's uh, the, entire the entire northern sea route. Aside from the direct impact caused by increased shipping traffic in these areas, such as uh, underwater noise, air and water pollution, ship strikes with marine mammals, um, destruction of ice ecosystem by icebreakers. There is also a risk from oil spills accidents, which can be catastrophic for these remote and pristine areas because of the cleanup operations are extremely difficult in the Arctic, as you may know. The impact can be devastating not only for this uh, ecosystems and for species, but also for the coastal indigenous and northern communities because their livelihoods depend on the health of these ecosystems. So just to sum up this slide, there will be a dramatic increase in shipping traffic because of the transporting the large volume of fossil fuels in these hazardous icy waters by oil tankers that are not always designed or ice reinforced to operate to sail in these conditions. So now moving back, uh, moving briefly to Alaska and Norway, that there are two, two other fossil fuel producing nations in the Arctic. Their volumes of production are smaller as compared to Russia, yet they are new investment are made um, and new fields are being developed right now. So in the last several years, the two largest investment decisions in the Arctic were made in those two countries. In Norway, it is a Johan Katzberg project located offshore in the Barents Sea. And in Alaska, it is a Willow project in the Alaska North Slope. In Alaska, the production has the potential to peak very late as well, in 2040. For Alaska, the largest source of future emissions will be coming from the developing of new fossil fuel fields. For Norway, the, uh, the Arctic production peak is expected around 2030, which is earlier, and then it will decline. The greatest potential source of excess emissions in Norway is the future production from the undiscovered sites that have received exploration licenses but have not been proven for drilling. So they haven't been yet appraised. So just to sum up 
generally, so what I've been talking here and what needs to be done in order to align fossil fuel production in the Arctic with the Paris emission reduction goals. At the very minimum, the governments should stop issuing permits for developing new fields and granting expl exploration licenses. Obviously, Russia has a huge role to play in this, and it should phase out the existing reserves, at least half of them, ahead of their schedule. There should be no public or private investment in infrastructure that enable these projects, because there is a very high risk that these facilities will become stranded assets once the demand for fossil fuel declines as it is predicted. So instead of being treated as a frontier for fossil fuel development, the Arctic region should become a leader in deploying renewable and clean energy, leaving its pristine ecosystem intact and mineral riches unexplored in the ground where they, they, they uh, should be and where they belong. Uh, so that's my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Elena. Um, before I make some questions, I would like to welcome our next speaker, uh, Tord, that will talk ab uh, about Norway on thin ice, Norway's fossil ambition, and the EU's uh, green energy future. Tord, yeah, we can see you already. Hello, how are you? Uh, let's just share the screen. So, uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, as Elena so uh, brilliantly explained in her presentations, there are many risks uh, with fossil fuel expansion, especially in the Arctic. And in this presentation, I will look at the economic transition risk, which we which means that we are not speaking about the consequence of climate change in itself, but more on the consequence of the necessary climate action for a large producer of oil and gas, namely Norway. And concretely, I'll be speaking about the gap in ambitions of the EU and Norway. And a natural starting point uh, is to ask why this is interesting to this topic. And uh, can just cut to the case, there's really one point that is by far the most important, and that point is trade. These figures show the EU's import of oil and gas in the second quarter of 2023. And the Norwegian share is marked in orange. And for gas, Norway is by far the largest supplier to the EU, supplying close to half of the gas that the EU imports. Uh, for oil, this figure is a bit more confusing. Uh, so the brown cake slice uh, is actually a category of others uh, consisting of many small suppliers. So Norway is actually also, although marginally, uh, the largest supplier of oil to the EU. But if you look to Norway, this picture is even stronger. Of uh, three fourths of Norway's gas export and two thirds of the oil export goes to EU countries. And most of the leftover export goes to another European country, the UK. Another point, uh, which is at least important in a Norwegian context, is that during the last couple of years, European energy security has emerged as one of the, if not the, most used argument for expansion of the Norwegian oil and gas industry. Throughout the last 50 years, uh, Norwegian oil and gas production has slowly but steadily been pushed further north, starting 
south on the Norwegian continental shelf in the North Sea, then moving north to the Norwegian Sea, and then to the Barents Sea, which is entirely in the Arctic. And as most of the resources in both the North Sea and the Norwegian Sea has already been produced, it is estimated that half of the remaining resources in Norway are in the Barents Sea. Uh, and therefore, this claim from the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate that the future uh, of petroleum activity in Norway is in the north. Since 2010, uh, Norway has distributed 133 exploration lines, licenses in the Barents Sea. But it has proved that uh, for petroleum activity to be quite challenges, uh, challenging in this area. Uh, this is due to the assets being far from shore and the weather conditions being harsh. Uh, and so the fields are both costly and take a lot of time to develop. And uh, the result of this is that uh, you get some challenging uh, uh, economic yeah, you get it. You, uh, this challenges the profitability of the fields, uh, with break even prices being much higher in the Barents Sea than in other parts of Norway. And you also have an issue regarding infrastructure. Uh, if we look back at the map, uh, the green lines show gas pipelines. And you can see that there's almost like a spider web when you look at the North Sea and the Norwegian Sea but then it stops. And in the Barents Sea, there's currently no pipelines except one transporting gas to an LNG plant on shore. And for any more uh, gas to be exported, uh, you would need to do new and costly infrastructure investment uh, for, for there to be any export of new gas. And there are ongoing efforts in Norway to get this done. So that's a bit, uh, a brief introduction to Norway. And we'll look a bit at the EU, uh, which is the main consumer of Norwegian oil and gas. And I probably won't need to tell you that many steps has been taken to accelerate the green energy transition uh, in the EU like the Green Deal, the Fit for 55, Repower EU, and so on. Uh, and this, along with high energy prices, has already led to a large decrease in the demand for gas. Uh, but going further into the future, uh, this picture just gets stronger. This graph shows uh, three scenarios for European gas demand until 2050. And these scenarios align with 2.4, 1.7, and 1.5 degrees of global warming. And what we can see is that demand is not only peaking, but also falls rapidly in two of the scenarios. And if we look at the scenario in which the 1.5 degree target is met, uh, the yellow line, uh, gas demand is 58% lower already in 2030 and almost 80% lower in 2035. So taking this into account, uh, no, no way is facing a few choices. And I'll start by just uh, pointing out the two graphs on the right. One is the graph you just saw of the European projected gas demand. And below you see projected production from the Barents Sea. And what we see is that in the 2030s, gas demand from Europe will fall up to 80% uh, in the 1.5 degree scenario, while production from the Barents Sea will more than double. And this exposed Norway to a massive transition risk as exporting to other regions than uh, Europe uh, will be rather difficult. So taking this into account, uh, some, of the, 
some of the choices Norway is facing now due to the transition, transition risk is if it's really the time now to distribute new exploration licenses in the Barents Sea and to approve new fields. Uh, is it the right time to invest in new infrastructure? Uh, for instance, the gas line to the European continent, uh, con continent that is considered. Uh, and lastly, something I haven't mentioned, uh, the Norwe Norwegian petroleum tax system is pretty much designed for good times with the state taking most of the costs, but also most of the income. And this has worked very well in the good times. The question is, uh, whether such a system is suitable for bad times as the government takes upon itself a lot of risk. And I think I'll stop my presentation there. Uh, thank you very much for listening in and good luck with your great work in Dubai. Thank you so much, Tord. And now I would like to bring our third presenter, Alexandre Prado, talking about oil and gas in Brazil. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning, we're here in Dubai. And so, I, following the, the other presentation, uh, we'll explain about, uh, to you about what's happening in Brazil, especially in the Amazon Basin region. And it's a little bit different from the Arctic, <laughs> but it's, uh, of course, it's a big challenge to how can we face uh, the oil industry sector in Brazil. So, the next one, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, what is the exactly the uh, what is the sector in Brazil? Oil and gas exploration. Um, Brazil is uh, between the ten uh, countries that uh, are developing oil and gas sector, and, uh, and until a few years ago, it was more based in near, near Rio de Janeiro, is in the southwest of Brazil. So. It's not that's very good, but it's not too bad. It's something that we usually do since uh, 1950, uh, so more than 70 years. And now, uh, maybe since 2000, yeah, we are moving to the north, and especially to the Amazon region. Since uh, so, I'll not read exactly what is there, but you can see. The next one, please. Um, so what is the environment impact that we have in the Amazon uh, Basin region? Is that we have there a great Amazon reef system that is al almost discovery. We don't know exactly what's there, or what's the biodiversity that we have there, and how the oil exploration will impact this biodiversity. So um, we have a transboundary effects biodiversity, especially considering uh, French Guyana, Guyana and Suriname and a little bit of Venezuela. But in fact, uh, the impact for the other region is huge, considering that's not only Brazil, when we are talking about Amazon Basin region. And uh, uh, of course, uh, when if we have something like uh, uh, what happened with deep water or, or, or horizon there in, in the Mexico region will be something catastrophic, not only for Brazil and not only for the Amazon Basin region, but, but it can go into Caribbean and, in, and maybe far away, we don't know exactly, but it's huge. Considering, of course, when you have a, a climate change that uh, can change the, um, the currents exactly, and then can move forward away. So, one uh, accident that happened there, well, will be crazy. <laughs> and of course, uh, we have the indigenous people that uh, are based in this region, the Amazon region, and they are not considered, especially even from now, and especially when we are we are uh, talking about climate change effects. The next one, please. So 
uh, what we are listening when you are talking the oil and gas sector, as you are in the Norway, we say, look, we would like to be like Norway. <laughs> they explore a lot, and they make a huge fund, and they have a lot of money to have, uh, of course, human uh, being and um, good life, and everyone um, have, uh, would like to have something like that. Why Brazil cannot? This is what we listen from our president and so on. And in fact, uh, the history in Brazil is that Brazil is not Norway. And uh, we are exploring uh, petroleum, oil and gas in Brazil since 1950, as I said. And we don't know exactly where the money goes. <laughs> in fact, we don't know. <laughs> we don't have a fund like that you have in Norway. And uh, we, what we know that we, our oldest region that we have in Brazil, near Rio de Janeiro, is not a, a Norway. And uh, as you know, what we see in Rio de Janeiro every week and what we have in the newspapers is not something quite similar and of Norway in 1950s. So uh, we don't have a, a good health system in Rio de Janeiro. We don't have a good education system in Rio de Janeiro. And so the money from the sector doesn't go to the population, and of course, not uh, never for indigenous people and local communities. So the question here is that um, when we take just uh, one region, the Amazon region, that we one city in Rio, in Amazon region that we already have uh, gas exploration, it's called Coari, is a little uh, municipality that we have there with a good budget for, for the region coming from the oil and gas sector. But in fact, uh, our, the index for education and health is terrible. And even is worse from the older municipalities in the region. So the money just doesn't go for what we they say should go. <laughs> so when we are listening from our president say, well, we need to explore oil and gas sector, because we need to improve our health system, education system. I agree with him, but I don't see this money go to this region. So the question is here, from where to who? Because we are not seeing what's happening there. The next one, please. Uh, so um, uh, again, uh, of course, in this COP, we are talking here, it's about the subsidies and royalties for the sector. And this is happening in Brazil too. So we have near, early in Brazil, near $23 billion uh, just to fossil fuel subsidies uh, for exploration and for consumption too. Um, uh, this is a one good question that we would like to see in this COP decision that the countries decide to phasing out not only the exploration, but the subsidies and the royalties of the sector, especially the subsidies. Because uh, if we see $23 billion for Brazil is a lot of money, and uh, uh, for a sector that is too huge, it's too huge not only in Brazil, but around the world. So why are we still doing that? If we should subsidize uh, like energy uh, uh, for um, uh, crazy for solar and wind and so on, so why we are still subsidizing something like uh, oil and gas sector around the world and in Brazil especially? This is the other question. So we have two questions here. One is about uh, uh, subsidies, and the other one is about about royalties. The next one, please. And uh, what we see there is the uh, quite similar what you showed us in the Arctic regions about the about the carbon bombs that we see there is the a massive cost to the climate and population. If we uh, explore all the potential from the Amazon region, just considering the Brazilian region, is near 1.5 gigatons. And annually, and, uh, so is almost the, the, the Brazilian emissions that we have. And uh, it's a social co cost of near 41 billion and, uh, by 2010, and uh, uh, near 400,000 deaths. So 
just considering the exploration of this region. So it's too huge impact when we consider uh, social and environmental impacts. The next one, please. And um, this is uh, the Amazon is, a, as you know, is a highly vulnerable to climate change. Even we have just uh, two, uh, two degrees rise, it's uh, treated more than one third of species uh, in the region. Uh, it, this is what we know, and we don't know a, a lot about the biodiversity in the Amazon. So what you can see here is uh, just uh, a catastrophic scenario, considering what is the carbon bomb that we have there. The next one, please. So, is that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Alexandri. And after these three presentations, I would like to bring you to the, discuss to the discussion. And my question is, after hearing this about these uh, areas that should be no-go zones and mm -hmm. are being exploited, and as we showed, they are not a good business. So I would like to understand what are the financial risks of these projects and that the companies keep doing it? And what is, why are they doing that? And how could they actually change uh, these investments and go to green energy? Yeah, well, thank you, Lena. Thank you, um, Pablo, for the, for, the speak, for, the, for the presentation. So um, yeah, there's of course a few like very big financial risk in, in investing in these projects. And obviously what we can imagine in a context of expected uh, declining demand is uh, stranded asset risk, right? And the significant write-off that would happen on companies' balance sheet and on countries' expected return for these uh, for these projects. Um, so the uh, the IA just uh, last year, or like or this year even, um, forecasted that oil and gas demand would peak during this decade. Uh, the IPCC also said that the... Um, that oil and gas demand needs to peak during this decade in order to align with 1.5 degrees Celsius. And, uh, and most recently, a uh, climate analytics report just showed that um, oil and gas demand might peak already next year and the year after for, for next year for gas and the year after for oil. As we see renewable energy investment growing s significantly faster than before, so especially wind and solar deployment um, are really exploding in the past few years, and it's expected to um, to grow faster than the increase in demand uh, of energy globally. So this means that it starts to displace the um, uh, oil and gas from the the energy system, and so that's why they predict that um, gas might peak in 2024 and oil in 2025 based on these on these numbers. So that's a very positive and encouraging sign, at least that we see like a significant shift in the energy system uh, that that um, that will peak oil and gas demand and will create a lot of stranded assets, though, if, especially as we keep licensing new oil and gas reserve in these area. And uh, so these projects also have significantly higher production costs, right? So they require really expensive new equipment and technologies to operate in extreme weather temperatures, like, like extreme cold or offshore deep sea mining projects. Um, and uh, the liability for cleaning up these projects is also extremely high compared to the expected returns that uh, they might expect. And, um, yeah, and beyond the environmental, social, and climate costs of these projects, there's also huge justice and equity concerns um, to, to developing these projects. So especially in the case of Norway and the US, like these are high income developed countries with high historical emissions that have relatively low dependence on their oil and gas uh, industry compared to other uh, oil and gas producer. And they have a very diversified economy. So if anything, like these countries should be the first one to phase out the oil and gas production and they should at minimum, phase out faster than global baseline indicate. And what global baseline indicate is that there's no room for new oil and gas field. So there will be increasing pressure for these countries to accelerate their energy transition and to phase out the oil and gas field. So that increase the pressure on stranded assets. And also, like, we need to be clear because they, they will open new oil and gas field. We do, do expect that. Um, and uh, so it needs to be clear about what are the implications of that. And this means abandoning the 1.5 degree target. It also means willingness to exacerbate inequity and the burden sharing of mitigation efforts globally. And also disregarding the um, differentiated responsibility and ignoring their larger capacity to transition. 
so the question is why do they they still investing in them right and what why are company continuing these um these projects and um so i feel first of all it's based on misguided expectation on um on growing demand of uh, only gas field but also the perverse incentive that this company have um so i mean we know that uh that, i mean they they want to preserve their market share even in a declining uh sector so i mean everybody wants to be the last producer standing and uh, not be uh like have their market share taken over because they are the first mover and the first one to uh, to decrease their their production and uh, and then they also have these like um key performance indicator uh, like uh, one of the main one is the reserve replacement ratio, right? That the uh, that they the, the, the rate themselves on, and that also uh, is a big uh, indicator for stock valuation and also for the stock option of CEO of oil and gas company, right? They get paid with the depending of the value of the share that they have after they exit the company, and when they have huge incentive to um, to grow uh, stock share, then that, that that's what they'll do. And um, and then there's also a huge problematic moral hazard of uh, oil and gas company when um, many of these uh, licensed reserves are actually covered by investment treaties. So these investment treaty they would protect uh, investor, foreign investor uh, investing in, in projects in in Brazil, in the, in, in the Amazon, or in the Arctic pro um, in the Arctic region. And so if a country decides to implement climate aligned um, oil and gas policy and phase out their, their production then and, and, and renege on their uh, on their license and decide not to develop any new field then they can sue government for the expected revenue or the expected potential revenue that would be lost in these cases and um, so that's effectively a way to um, to transfer stranded asset risk to the public because then government would have to risk uh, the, and, and you have to compensate oil and gas company for this risk. So in the short term, companies can grow the stock value by deploying new reserves and uh, increasing their, uh, their asset side and their company valuation. And then if ever they cannot exploit this reserve, then like, they can be covered by this investor state dispute settlement that they can activate through investment treaties and then get potentially reimbursed. Um, so yeah, so I mean, the, there's a few things that are driving this key investment on, on top of that, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of government support, of course, that makes this uh, project uh, uh, financially sensible, right? So all these subsidies, the tax break, tax break, the um, international public finance, and also all the favorable regulatory condition, all, all contributing to make these um, this project economically sensible, so to say. Uh, but it's a very unbalanced level playing field uh, that, that supports this industry. And um, yeah, so I mean, so should I go about how to redirect part financial flow now, or do you want to no, come back? Okay. okay. Yes, please, yeah. if you could, please go on. So um, we've identified a few key things that uh, government and company can do, and, and financial institution especially can do to reorient private capital flows. And um, the first thing would really need to be like no new uh, project finance. So project finance is like an easy. Um, first milestone that financial institution and banks rule out like provision and facilitation of, of these assets. Um, but then banks also require their clients and companies they're investing in to put in place uh, net zero transition plans. And uh, these transition plans uh, need to eventually uh, include exclusion policies for oil and gas companies that have, uh, that have uh, new investment in new oil and gas fields. But for now, uh, I mean, 95% of all oil and gas companies have expansion plans, right? So, um, so that's why it needs to be some engagement policies. And these engagement, uh, it, if they happen, should be time-bound with appropriate milestone and also escalation steps to make sure that if the companies don't make uh, credible transition plans, that at least there is um, a time to, to exit and time to divest from, from, from these companies. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's why investors also have a mandate to uh, to investigate the, the feasibility of these company transition plans. And that's also where civil society organization has a huge role to play in terms of tracking and monitoring what's happening with these um, with these plans and see whether they're credible or based on carbon capture and storage and a very narrow definition of emission scope and only focusing on scope one and two, for example. 
Um, and um, yeah, and also financial institutions should also, in, in, in their public affairs work and in their lobbying, should include efforts to end oil and gas licensing and, uh, and to phase out direct and indirect fossil fuel subsidies. So they can help policymakers to create the enabling condition for them to have profitable investment outside of the oil and gas sector. So for now, there's a lot of incentive and fi the financial architecture is really bound to the oil and gas system in, in many ways and uh, investment in renewable energy sometimes not as, um, as 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 convenient to invest in oil. I mean they don't have the same um, asset type and the same type of protection and, and also they have high interest rate in developing countries so it needs to be some facilitation de-risking um, and, and financial regulation to facilitate these uh, these investments, um, and yeah, I think I think I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Yeah. That's a great answer. Thank you very much. And uh, related to that, I would like to go back to Elena, and I would like to understand related to that, related to knowing that in the end the the companies trying to do oil and gas exploration are the ones that are being protected. And I, I would like to understand what are the implications for opening new frontiers in areas like the Arctic that should be no-go zones, that used to be new frontiers, but now are being normalized. What are the implications of that? Um, yes, thank you so much. And thank you, Olivier. That uh, was an excellent uh, explanation of, of what is driving those uh, investments and those projects, despite that we expect that the demand for fossil fuels are going to fall soon, but if you look at the production levels, they still keep growing, and so there will be a gap, production gap, and what's gonna happen to those projects. And now they're pushing the frontiers as if there will be growing, infinitely growing demands. And so back to your question, uh, Helena. So I probably should start with just reminding us that there is some positive side of pushing the frontiers, right? In some respect, the history of our civilization is all about pushing the frontiers, you know, leaving the familiar environment, going into the unknown, testing our limits, ex expanding the horizons, you know, that's what's happening right now in the Arctic in some ways. But there has been like a tremendous history and bravery and the great explorers, you know, in the polar regions, you know, they do represent the bravery and, you know, the cu curiosity and the willingness to take the risks. So there's some good stuff about pushing the frontiers. And as a human civilization, we are pushing frontiers now into space, exploring, you know, the areas outside of our planet, going to the stars. I mean, it's all admirable. The kids like that. And, you know, yes, that's what we do as humans. We take the risks. Uh, I think this notion pushing the frontiers is deeply embedded in us as humans, in our history, in our literature, in our mythology, in our collective psyche, you know, this, the Odyssey journey to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield, that's admirable, you know, that's truly admirable. However, you know, the pushing, forcing fuel frontiers in the Arctic, in the sensitive Amazon coastal regions, you know, it's the different story. It's a story of getting into pristine areas, and it's not about the bravery of human spirit here. It is actually about, I think it's about the greed and making super profits, and what's just Olivier explained is about this perverse incentives also that are driving those projects. So, you know, the treating our planet, I'm just going beyond the Arctic here, but treating our planet as a source of the infinite growth and the infinite mineral extraction is going to actually undermine us as a civilization, right? So it will lead to our demise eventually, and actually very soon, very soon. So destroying the very foundation upon which our economies are built, you know, the, the, the climate, the ecosystem that provide uh, essential ecosystem services and functions, you know, if, if there will be no economy in the end and no money to make in the end as well. So we really need to make it clear and we really ma make it clear that it has to stop and it has to stop really fast. And so the governments and the industry and the financial sector and civil society, we all have the role to play in this, to make it clear that at this COP meeting that there will be this clear message that we need to start the process of phasing out 
oil and gas in pristine areas and elsewhere for the sake of our civilization, for the sake of our children and for all of us. Thank you very much. And before I go back to Tord and we talk more about financing, I would like to talk to Alessandri first, the other frontier that we're talking about. And Alessandri, if I understand, when we talk about oil in the Amazon, we are not only talking about onshore oil, we are talking about offshore as well, because we call it the blue Amazon and the green Amazon, right? And those are areas that were tried before, and there were other companies that gave up those areas. So I would like to understand why, again, this keeps happening. Why are those risky projects still happening? Why are companies still wanting to drill for oil and gas in the Amazon? Thank you for asking, Helena. And uh, I think that uh, Brazil, not only Brazil, but Guyana and Suriname, and the countries that are based in the Amazon region, they see the aspiration of this region of oil and gas like the last change, the last chance <laughs> to, to have cash and to have money to do whatever they would like to do. And uh, and uh, because of that, it's like a race that is happening in the Arctic and in Norway and in, in the US, and it's the same in Brazil. And uh, of course, uh, our petroleum company is trying to be the last company to explore oil and gas around the world. They said that it, this year. So, uh, and the, the the Amazon region is our is the best. I don't know. They say it's a huge region to explore and then explore it region until now. So, could be like the uh, like the for me. Remember what's happening in the U.S. during the gold read times. You know that everyone would like to find places and so on, something like they they like this region. They see that this region like that, and uh, so. I think the terrible here, that's when I'm listening to you, they, uh, and I uh, agree that uh, for Occidental uh, civilization from Europe, uh, explore and go around new frontiers is something, it's like it's a humanity, you know, thing. I don't think that, really. I think that for us in the Amazon, it's uh, even the history in Brazil, uh, this idea of uh, frontiers that's, Oh, they think that we have nobody there. It's completely wrong and catastrophic. This is what we see in the region. We have a lot of indigenous people living there, and they, of course, they don't emit any carbon, <laughs> and they will suffer a lot. That's something. And the, the the idea of exploration in the Amazon region is something that's terrible. What for indigenous people in local communities? Uh, so uh, for us around the world, that we, of course we know that we need Amazon region pristine. Without the Amazon, it's impossible to have, to reach the two degrees, or of course impossible to reach 1.5. So we need to steal the Amazon there with the people, indigenous people living there, that they are maintaining the forest, conserving the forest, the biodiversity services, the ecosystem services, and the rivers, and so on. And uh, I think that um, uh, uh, not only a sense of economic, it's, it's, it's terrible because it's too expensive to explore something that we don't know how much it costs. We don't know because it's a new frontier. And uh, it's a completely, completely, completely unethic. Can I say that? Because I think until uh, 18th or 19th century, uh, we can say that explorer is something that the, the society like it. But now we know that we don't like it. It's, it's terrible. Uh, it's complete, completely unethic. And, uh, it's uh, under our value, new value in our society in uh, 21th century. It's impossible when we think uh, to explore a region, killing people and people that even don't know that we don't that exist. So I think that we need to really think about that too. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Alexandre and I are both Brazilians. Yes. And we grew up uh, listening that uh, oil in Brazil, it's the lottery ticket. 
and we have it and we cannot sit on top of it, we have to use it. And I've heard something similar about this uh, in Norway, saying that Norway it should be, they were saying that they have the best oil exploration. So they should be the last drop of oil that is extracted should be Norway. So I would like to invite Tord in a question about this. I would like to understand what are the risks of oil exploration in the Norwegian shelf? And even further, what are the risks of Norway not going for a green energy transition now and taking this step of, instead of doing that, going for more oil exploration? Uh, yeah, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think you have you have two sides of this answer. You have the um, uh, fiscal side, so uh, the expenses uh, for the Norwegian government. As I mentioned in the end of the presentation, uh, the tax system in Norway means that the government is covering 78% of the cost of both exploration but also investment in production. And, uh, and takes 78% of the income. And uh, this means that if there's a drop in uh, demand and also a drop in uh, oil and gas prices, the government could actually be stuck with uh, quite a large chunk of expenses in this end, hopefully, of the oil and gas era. So that's one part of the, of the answer. Uh, the other is more general, because um, looking at the Norwegian economy on a whole, uh, it's fairly difficult to transition when you have uh, a very lucrative oil and gas industry on, with high activity, because you compete, uh, different industries compete for the same capital in the form of money, but also in the form of people and human capital. So. Uh, building building up new industries that could uh, be uh, be beneficial to the Norwegian economy in the long run uh, will be hard as long as there's such a high activity in the petroleum sector. And so you uh, risk delaying uh, the green transition and also the transition to a more healthy economy in the long run. Thank you, Todd. Um, we only have two more minutes. I'm sorry, we got a little bit carried away because it's such an interesting subject. But I would like to know if anyone uh, watching has any questions. Yes, please. Um, ah, sorry. There it is. Thank you. My name is Emilio Godoy. Um, Interpress service journalist uh, from Mexico. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, how do you assess the oil lobby here at, at COP? And second question, uh, how would uh, non-producing countries in Latin America push against Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, which uh, um, whatsoever are not thinking about abandoning fossil fuels? no matter what. Thank you. If I can break the ice. Um, what you, the last thing that you said I think is really interesting because uh, what we see in projects like the projects in the Amazon, the Blue Amazon, in the coast of Brazil, is that they have transboundary uh, effects. So if there is a blowout in the coast of Brazil, there is going to be transboundary effects to many other countries in South America. So one way I think that countries can push is because of that, because they are going to be affected even though they are not producers. And that can be a way to pressure those countries, especially like in this case, Mercosur and all of that. Pressuring because they are going to receive the effects, but they are not the ones that are going to get any of the good part, let's say, that I don't think is good, but anyway, I think that could be one way. I can say a quick word on, on, on your first question. And um, so basically, I just want to point out again that like all the science is really clear that like around like any temperature target, we need to stop developing new oil and gas fields right away and that 
just s s simply put regarding the oil lobbyists and COP, you know, I think it's 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 not the place to cut oil and gas deals, uh, and that I think that it doesn't have its its, its place um, over here, and that we should focus on on what's happening in the negotiations and try to have an ambitious deal to phase out fossil fuels. Can I, can I also add to? I will just add to the very same. I think we will have to assess whether the lobby, oil and gas lobby, is effective here or not. In the very end, if we see the phasing out of fossil fuel actually makes to the definitive statements in the end of this COP28. If it doesn't make there, there is no clear messages that it has to be done as phasing out, not phasing down, phasing out. Then we know that they have not succeeded. And if it doesn't, then unfortunately they have. Sorry, who has the microphone? Could you please? Thank you. Thank you. I'm very supportive of all of what you've said. I represent local government. So the problem that we have with the public when we are promoting renewable energies, uh, not oil and gas, is that they say the land use is so much greater because the renewables are less efficient. Um, we have offshore, but it's more expensive. Offshore wind, but it's more expensive. They want, um, the, you know, vast areas, 35,000 acres in my region, my immediate region, um, of to be covered with solar panels. And that is a big loss of farmland. So this is the question I'm struggling to answer. How do I get around that? Thank you. I, mean, I, I can say a few words to that, um, but basically, I, I think it's it's it's, it's a bit of a, um, of a debunked myth that uh, renewable energy is still more expensive to, to deploy, especially in the all northern western economies per kilowatt hour, and the uh, LCOE cost is significantly cheaper, uh, both on the upstream and downstream side of things. Um, and then, in terms of m mineral resource and land use, I feel that the, um, the Social, economic, and um, environmental and pollution like consequences of developing new oil and gas field and just of continuing to exploit existing reserve are significantly worse than what would occur with uh, the development of, um, of of critical mineral that are required to build these uh, uh, renewable energies. And uh, so it's definitely a lesser than two evils. And, uh, and then there's much new technologies and innovation that can be made in order to recycle batteries more effectively and to have uh, more of a circular uh, chain for uh, deploying renewable energy capacity. Yeah. I'm so sorry, but I'm going to have to stop because we already went over time. Uh, but we can keep talking at the coffee outside. And thank you very much for everyone who watched this here and from home. And yeah, let's phase out all fossil fuels. Thank you very much. Yeah.